Good morning, good afternoon, and Draswitye. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the webinar, Protecting Oak Trees for Future Generations in Europe and Central Asia. My name is Shiroma Satya Pala, Forest Health and Protection Officer at FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I am moderating today's webinar. This webinar is jointly organized by the FAO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia and the Forest Invasive Species Network for Europe and Central Asia, REUFIS. This is, there is an increase in the threat of forest invasive species to the health, sustainability and productivity of natural and planted forests globally. Today, in many countries, invasive species are considered to be the second most reason for biodiversity loss after habitat disruption. Forest invasive species outbreaks are in many ways very similar to COVID-19, what we are experiencing now. It's transboundary and its spread is associated with human mobility and in trade. An action by one country is not sufficient to manage the spread. Therefore, Coordinated international action is fundamental to protect the world forest from transboundary insect pests, pathogens, invasive vertebrates, and plants. We have three objectives of this session. First, to raise regional awareness and preparedness for future pest and disease outbreaks in oak forest. Secondly, to share experiences on good practices on integrated pest management for pest and diseases of oak species. And last but not least, to contribute to the goals of the International Year of Plant Health, IYPH 2020. Before kicking off, let me share some guidance on how to engage in this webinar. This webinar will be running in English with interpretation in both Russian to English and English to Russian. To change the language, please select the language of your choice on the bottom bar. You can see the bottom bar, there is a language option. You will be able to engage through the question and answer box and the general chat box. So for questions, please use the question and answer box Please indicate the name of panelists to whom you address the question. And also, we are very keen to hear your insights and thoughts, and you can use the general chat box for this. It is our great pleasure to present today and uh, to this seminar, and we are very glad you have put aside time to discuss this really important issue, the agenda. An overview on the status of oak species will be presented by Dr. Alexis Ducoutou in Indra, France. And this is uh, followed by a keynote presentation by Dr. George Stoka, Narik Forest Institute, Hungary. And then this will be followed by four country presentations from the region. We will then move to the question and answer session from the uh, Q&A box and we'll wrap up in approximately two hours from now. Now, to make an introductory message, I'd like to invite Professor Ferenc Lakatos, Secretary for the Forest Invasive Species Network for Europe and Central Asia. Ferenc is a professor at the University of Sopron, Hungary, Faculty of Forestry, Institute of Silviculture and Forest Protection. His main areas of interest are bark and wood boring insects, in invasive species biology, and also in invasive species uh, population dynamics. Since 2016, he has been the secretary for the FAO Regional Network on Forest Invasive Species in Europe and Central Asia. The floor is yours, uh, parents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiroma, for your kind uh, opening words. And may I also welcome all the panelists and uh, participants to our webinar today on protecting oak trees for the future generations in Europe and Central Asia. And uh, let me introduce our uh, network in a, in, a, in a nutshell in two slides, uh, just to get you familiar with uh, 
with our network, what we are doing. So the RailFIS network has been established in 2017 after an initiative of several countries in the region and uh, supported by the regional office of the FAO. At the moment, we have 31 member countries. Uh, yeah, you can see all the member countries on the map on the right hand side. We have four thematic areas. We are concentrating for, on four thematic areas on plants, pathogens, invertebrates, invertebrates. All of them belong to the forest invasive species. At the very beginning, we set several objectives we would like to achieve in the near future. The first is uh, to promote the collaboration between the member countries, because sometimes it's really needed uh, to share the expertise and information on forest invasive species, and of course, to coordinate the activities in the region on this uh, group of uh, species. Of course, there is a need of, to raise awareness in the management uh, of uh, forest invasive species, and we are trying to act as a link, uh, a communication link with international and regional organization across the region, so both in Europe and Central Asia. Uh, our recent activities included uh, annual meetings and regular trainings. One of our first training was in uh, 2017 on bark and ambrosia beetles identification. You can see a picture on the right hand side from this training. But we had also training on forest pathogens in 2018 or even invasive pests and pathogens in nut trees. And today we have a, a webinar on protecting oak trees for the future generation in Europe and Central Asia. And the last point I would like to highlight before I give the floor back to Shiroma that uh, we are trying to be bilingual, uh, mainly because of the region we are working on. So our web page is also bilingual. We are trying to uh, provide information both in English and, uh, and Russian. So thank you very much for your attention. And I uh, hand over to you, Shiroma, now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ferenc, for your warm welcome from Forest Invasive Species Network for Europe and Central Asia. This is one of the uh, Forest Invasive Species Network FAO is facilitating and it is also facilitating Forest Invasive Network for Asia Pacific, Africa and Near East. Now I can see more than 100 participants uh, in this webinar. Uh, to say exactly, we have 140. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Alexis Ducurso, who will provide us an overview on oak species in the region. Alexis has a doctorate in genetics and biology of plant population and is currently a research engineer at the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment. He manages a large network of experimental tests in area of approximately 240 hectares spread over the whole of France. He also has been awarded by the Forum for a Best Silviculturist of the Year. Please, Alexis, the screen is yours. Okay, do, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we can uh, see okay. the, uh, yeah. I have one problem. I cannot share my screen again. <laughs> Uh, we can uh, we can see the uh, um, uh, can you put uh, put the screen to full yes i try but i can't uh, <laughs> uh, do you see my screen sorry yes uh, we can see the screen uh, and it is a full screen or not um, Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Is, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, then. Now, okay. Yeah. Okay. The aim of my talk is an overview of the status of oak in Europe and Central Asia. Okay. Here we have a map of uh, oak in the world. Oops, what happened? Um, we have 244 species in America, uh, 180 species in uh, 
Europe on Central Asia, but this number de, uh, depends on author. It, it could be from uh, uh, 24 to uh, 43. And we have also 183 uh, species in uh, Asia. We can see a different photo of oak wood on the oak in, uh, in the world. On the left, uh, on the uh, here, here we, on the on the bottom, we can see uh, oak forest in Pennsylvania, in the eastern part of US. The central uh, photo, we can see a small bush in desert, in American desert. It is um, uh, a, a, an oak. And on the top, we can see Quercus alba, and it is in the great video, and we have only um, uh, isolated trees. In the central uh, part, we can see two, fo two photos from uh, Europe. On the left, it is uh, Quercus pubescens on the Calcareous Plateau. On the right, it is a young population of cecic oak in France. On the right, we can see different oak forests in Asia. On the top, it is a riparian forest in uh, Japan with Quercus crispula. Uh, and in the middle, it is a uh, oak forest in a rain uh, tropical forest of, um, of uh, Taiwan. And uh, the last photo is uh, a mixture of uh, Quercus blackei on different species of Castanopsis in the northern part of Laos. It is also a, rain, uh, a tropical rain forest. Oak and coat wood have many uses. The first one is uh, wood production, and the price could be very high. It can, reach uh, 450 euro per cubic meter for cask industry or veneer. On the record, we, could, we can sell one tree per year in France where the price reach 3,000 euro per cubic meter. It's produced for mushroom like boletus, trifle, acorn for human feed. For example, in France, we had a powder named uh, Rakaout des Arabes which was produced up to uh, 1950. Uh, for example, in Spain, it's feed the livestock and uh, we can produce a very high quality ham named Ramon Serrano. It is a very good forest for hunting, for uh, venison with a very high quality meat, uh, with cholesterol free meat. Another uh, major feature of uh, oak is the associated biodiversity. Uh, there is a very, very high uh, associated biodiversity with different oak species. On this uh, table, we can see the number of associated fungi in uh, Switzerland with different uh, genus. Quercus, the genus Quercus has the highest uh, uh, diversity with 581 species uh, associated species, uh, followed by uh, Habies and uh, Fagus and Fraxinus also. We have exactly the same observation for insects, mammals, the flora, bacteria, and pathogen. It's a, it is very interesting for this issue. And it is due that the, it is due to the fact that a lot of genes are involved in a biotic interaction. Here we can see the phylogenetic tree of uh, the genus Quercus. We can see uh, all the different species in this stu study of Andrew Heap, and uh, all the species uh, located in uh, Europe and uh, Central Asia uh, have uh, the green arrow. The genus uh, uh, Quercus is divided in two subgenus on different sections. The oak of our region are uh, spread in three sections. The section Quercus, which is the main uh, section, it is a white oak. One very small section with only one species, Quercus pontica, and the, sub, the section Ceris with uh, olm oak, for example, uh, or uh, Quercus series. Uh, now we turn on the major feature, genetic feature of oak. 
Spoke has the highest genetic diversity in the living world. If we compare to women, to, to men, sorry, <laughs> um, the, the genetic diversity is 400 times than in man. And man has only 20,000 genes. And if we compare to uh, pedonriculate oak, we know that to, uh, this uh, species has at least uh, 43 genes. The, the species has also a very high genetic variability within and between species, and you, we will illustrate the, this with two photos. Most of the genes are involved in a biotic interaction, symbiosis, and pathogen. That means the, uh, the genus Quercus are really uh, well equipped uh, for living with a pathogen. It is also a complex species, a complex of species. It is not two species. And hybridization occurs between all species within a section. And this species has also a very high speed of genetic evolution. And it is really striking for this point. Here we can compare genetic variability of oak. And I have taken only the example of phenology. On the left photo, we can see a provenance from Hungary, which is a very early provenance. On the right, it is a French provenance from Fontainebleau, which is a forest close to Paris, and it is a late provenance. On the right, we can see the genetic variability within a population. On the left, we can see a regular oak, and on the right, what we call a June oak, and we are in June, and this oak will, uh, the bud burst will occur in June or July. It is a very late oak. Now we will see different streets, and we will start with the most common species in our region, which is uh, Quercus robur. We, have three, we will see, review three level ecosystem. And uh, for example, most of the riparian forest has uh, disappeared, have disappeared in Western Europe. A lot of marginal population has disappeared, and we had a huge problem with decay due to climate change. And we can see on this photo a population of uh, uh, pedunculate oak uh, in my region. We have also a threat at the species level with insect, fungi, and we are really concerned with oak wilt, which can eradicate all the white oak in Europe and in Central Asia if we introduce this uh, fungi from US. We have problem, a major problem with Phytophthora, for example, with cork oak, holm oak. We have problems with silviculture, with conversion to intensive forestry of population. We have problems with deer, overpopulation of deer, who deer, with rodent, with bird. We have also street at genetic, on genetic resources. With silviculture, when we introduce exotic genetic diversity, when we introduce uh, population from very far, uh, uh, and we, we have this problem in Europe. We have uh, a problem with reduction of gene flow because, for example, seed dispersor has uh, strong de uh, decrease with, for example, J, crow, and so on. We have also problem with migration due to the crisis with the seed dispersor, but also due to the fragmentation of ter territory due intensive farming, uh, housing, uh, road, and so on. And we have also a problem with the decrease of natural selection due to defoliating carpet, caterpillar, rodent, or deer and roe deer. And this problem with this uh, whole phenomenon uh, reduces the speed of evolution, and it is very important uh, with uh, the context of climate change. We have threat also with rare species. For example, here we have Quercus vulcanica. It is a very nice oak species. It remains only 12 population only in Turkey, and this population are covering about 800,000 hectares, and it is a small 
islands, very often surrounded with very intensive farming or step. And that means the risk of uh, extinction is very high for this species. Uh, we have other examples in this zone with Kerkus afares, it remains only 700 individuals. With Kerkus crenata, it remains 1,100 individuals. Quercus sicula disappeared in 2007. Now, on the map, we can see the distribution, uh, the number of species in different zones. We can see we, that we have 80, uh, 28 species around Basin Mediterranean in, in uh, Caucasus, uh, five species in Middle Europa, and two species in northern part of uh, Europe. On the left, we can see a table with all the species of this uh, region and the level of risk with ecosystem species and genetic diversity. The color indicates the risk from uh, dark green when there is no problem to extinction when the species is probably extinct. And we can see that most of the species are threatened at ecosystem species or genetic diversity. For example, for uh, Quercus afares, it is the first species on the top of this table. It is threatened at ecosystem level due to overgrazing, fire, food wool, and also for the genetic diversity because it remains only 700 individuals. For example, for Quercus uh, petrea, Cecil O, it's okay for ecosystem on the spatial level, but they are also uh, threat for uh, genetic diversity. On for Quercus uh, sicula, um, who these species has probably uh, disappeared. It was a species uh, endemic to Sicilia. And if we look at the uh, different region of Europe and Middle East, we have uh, for the northern part an indication of the problem with the number of species and uh, the different risk. No problem, important and major concern, extinction risk or extent. And at ecosystem level, specialist level, and genetic resource uh, level. And we can see that there is no problem in the northern part of Europe. In uh, the middle zone of Europe, we have a risk, important and major concern for two species over five for genetic resources. And when we are in the Mediterranean basin in Caucasus, the situation is really different. We have major problem uh, and even extension risk for ex ecosystem species and genetic resources. And we must put effort, huge effort in this uh, region if we want to maintain the diversity of oak at ecosystem species and genetic uh, diversity. Thank you for your, your attention. Spasiba. Thank you very much, Alexis, for the excellent overview of different oak species in the region. Great to hear there are 183 uh, different species in the region. And also it's the high diversity and the importance. Now, I would like you all to participate in a small poll. So on your screen, you will see a first poll question. What are the three main uses of oak species or oak forest in your country? Or um, you have in Russian as well. Please um, click the answers and then uh, we will give the results to you.
Can we have the answers of the poll? It is very interesting because when you have uh, more than 100 uh, participants, it's a very good forum for us to actually conduct a survey to know more about the, um, the, the, this important issue. So, um, are we okay with the results? It seems to be there is a um, small delay with the um, poll results. Okay, so um, it's very interesting. So 84% is saying it is used for timber and also, um, but then for pork, I think uh, not many countries, uh, uh, it's there, 8%, but it's a good number. And also uh, non-wood forest products, 27%, and also roadsides and parks, 37%. And then it's very good to see the ecosystem services people have mentioned 49%. That's a very good one. And if you need, please let us know. We can share this uh, um, uh, poll results later with you. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to go to our keynote speaker, Dr. George Choka. George is a forest entomologist working for the Hungarian Forest Research Institute. He's the head of the Department of Forest Protection located in North Hungary. His main fields of research are impacts of climate change on forest health, trends of the Hungarian oak forest health, forest insect pests, and biotic factors regulating forest insect population. I'm pleased to invite Dr. George Choka to give his speech. George, the screen is yours. Thank you, Shiroma. I try to share my screen. That's Fine. F five. So first of all, I would like to say thanks for for organizers for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure to to get the opportunity to share my view on oak oak health and oak pests and pathogens. The 15 minutes is very short, so I just jump into the middle of the story. Uh, we all know and all agree that oaks are extremely wonderful, extremely important, but quite complicated sometimes. I, I uh, have this uh, opinion about phylogenetic taxonomy and hybridization of oaks. Maybe it's not so complicated for Alexis, but certainly sometimes complicated for me. We all know the importance of, of oaks from economic point of view and also from recreational point of view. I like this kind of special recreation very much, particularly if you, if you have some fine red wines here and cholesterol free venison stew if possible. Uh, but the other very uh, serious part of importance of oaks is biodiversity. So on this, on this image, you see something like 70 species of herbivore insects feeding on oaks. And this, only, this number is only 10% of the close to 700, 650 species of oak herbivore insects feeding on, on our oaks in just in Hungary. The number in, in whole Europe would be something like 800. And if, if you, if you uh, widen the scope, uh, North Africa and, and uh, Central Asia, this number could be uh, even close to 1,000. And so just, I'm just talking about herbivore insects, meaning, meaning uh, insects feeding on living tissues of oaks. And another very important fact that almost half of these 650 species are obligately connected to oaks, so oak specialists. And it it's demonstrates very well the, the irreplaceable uh, importance of oaks in, in maintaining biodiversity. But unfortunately, our oaks, oak forests or ecosystems are under pressure. One source of pressure is climate change. 
on this graph you see the red line is is the early mortality of sessile oaks uh, in our experimental plots and the 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 blue line is a is a widely used uh, uh, drought index so the evident conclusion is is the mortality is dependent on the the weather so you in in dry years in in if there are many dry years in a row the the mortality rate will will increase and in in less dry years the mortality rate will decrease of course climate change will not directly immediately kill the oak trees but the frequent and severe droughts predispose the trees make them weakened and may trigger more severe and more frequent outbreaks of pests and pathogens too. And the other, other phase of the climate change is, is the increase of frequency of, of extreme uh, weather events like, uh, like uh, frost, late frost or, or, or storms. And they, this, these uh, weather extremes can also also cause quite serious abiotic calamities, disturbances, damage, whatever you want to call them. The, similarly to the oaks, diverse herbivore entomofauna, the, the uh, mycoflora is also very rich as already was mentioned by Alexis. And so there are many, many different relationships between the, the fungi and oaks. So there are many, many uh, species, what you call uh, pathogens or or uh, even even lateral pathogens and there are there is a species uh, considered and and sold as as uh, medicine and the last two are edible boletus is edible many times and the death cap is edible only once in a lifetime so better not try it uh, I just want to pick up two pathogens, and one is oak powder mildew, which is a very good demonstration of the long-lasting or, or even everlasting impact of an invasive species. It's probably originated from tropic, some tropical region present in Europe for more than 100 years, and it's considered as a main failure reason of the main main reason of the failure of the natural regeneration of Quercus robur and also has very serious impact on sessile oak. You can see sessile oak seedlings uh, heavily infested by, by this powder mildew. And uh, its uh, severe infestations regularly occur after drought, years of drought or insect defoliation. And even on, on old trees, it can have very serious effect uh, it stops or, or uh, hinders the, the lignification and therefore it makes the old trees shoots, the, the current year shoots more frost sensitive. So it can cause parsing of the crown of the old oak tree. And just one graph about the trend of the, the uh, mildew infestation in the Hungarian oak forest, it, it's a frighteningly increasing trend, unfortunately. One more thing, the, this is the Phytophthora ramorum species, which can cause serious uh, oak decline and even sudden death in the US. It's, it's, the species is present in U many European countries and cause mass mortality in, uh, in large trees in the United uh, Kingdom. So far, and it's very important to emphasize, so far it doesn't have any serious effect on oaks in Europe. But so far means that uh, so, so far doesn't mean that it will never happen. So it, it's a kind of Trojan horse, and this called the attention of the for the importance of of very intensive monitoring. So we have to keep our eyes for this species and for many other species which are already present but didn't cause any serious troubles. But have, we have the chance that they will become more invasive and more, more serious, they will have more serious impact. The uh, 160, uh, 100, uh, uh, six, sorry, 650 species of herbivore insects can produce quite a large number of, let's say, uh, potential pests of oaks. 
don't worry i won't i won't uh, discuss them one by one i just pick up three species one is the the oak procession in moth which is a, a oak monophagus oak specialist uh, uh, species and on top of its its forest health related importance the the human health related importance is also very very high because the caterpillars have irritating hairs and can cause seriously uh, unpleasant skin inflammation. And on this graph, you see the, the weather dependence of the fluctuation of the species. The blue line is a kind of uh, species specific drought index for this oak procession remote, what we worked out in our institute. And the, the red line uh, uh, demonstrate the yearly fluctuation of population fluctuation of the species and it's that the dependence is, is uh, quite evident so the in other words we can say that if the spring uh, and early summer is dry and hot the population will increase and if the spring and early summer is is uh, uh, cold and rainy the population will decrease it fits quite well to this this uh, map which was taken from a very recent and very fine publication. The dots representing the, the uh, present distribution, distribution of data of the species and the green area is the, the shaded, the shaded green is the potential distribution of the species by 2050. Uh, so the, the host plants are present and the climate, if the climate change scenarios uh, uh, are coming through uh, the these places will be these territories will be suitable for for oak processionary moth. Uh, I have to mention that uh, the the species was already found in in Ireland quite far north, so it's it's the spreading uh, exp expansion of the distribution is quite evident. Uh, a very classic and well-known species, gypsy moth, Livantria dispar. If you see this map, we can easily safely call the species as king of the oak defoliators in, in Europe. Uh, and even there are some predictions that if the, the climate change is, is continuing, the, the distribution of the, the species will expand very far north. So the, the shaded area is the rest, uh, present distribution and the dots are the, the locations will become, probably will become uh, suitable for the species if the climate change scenarios are true. Uh, but there is a player, there is an actor on the stage which will act exactly to the uh, opposite direction in case of gypsy moss. This is a entomopathogenic fungi, fungus uh, called entomophaga maimaga. And it was uh, deliberately introduced to Europe, to Bulgaria, Georgia, and Serbia many times, and causes very, very serious mortality in the uh, in the gypsy moth populations. And it seems to regulate quite well the species. Uh, this is the, the the present distribution, present known distribution in in Europe. And one thing that. Since the, the fungus was uh, introduced to Bulgaria, uh, the, the area damaged by gypsy moss on the early base decreased very significantly. The, the, uh, it was found in Hungary in 2013, and since then we hardly have any, any uh, uh, gypsy moss uh, problem. Uh, it, can, may, can mean that it's gypsy moat is, is dethroned, but don't worry, uh, there are many, many candidates to become new kings. And so we won't, won't uh, miss the de oak defoliations in the future. The third species is, is uh, an invasive, North American invasive species. You can see the, see the, the stepping stones of its spread in Europe and the, the, the symptoms. So it's very large scale uh, discoloration and, and leaf desiccation uh, in the middle of the vegetation season. And it's very important because almost one, uh, almost two thirds of, of the species resistance, more than 400 species feeding on oak leaves. 
And what is known so far for, for this uh, oak lace bark? I, I don't want to read all lines. It's just very, very, very fast expansion. Uh, we, they are already published results on, on uh, significant physiological effects. All oaks are potential hosts. There are hardly any native enemies and there are other, other effects uh, predicted. Uh, so it, probably in long term it will cause serious uh, troubles with, with oak, oak health and oak growth. Uh, also on oak fecundity and destru destructive effect on, on oak related diversity like insects, fungi. And it seems that only classical biological control uh, is the option to, to fight these species. My personal opinion, this is potentially the most harmful, harmful invasive insects on oaks we have ever seen. Uh, it's just a sheet uh, showing the, the extent of oak, oak uh, forest in Europe. So uh, the, the uh, yellow columns uh, indicate species which are not uh, suitable hosts for the, the oak lace bark, but even so at least 30 million hectares of oak forest in Europe provide acceptable hosts for the OLB. I wouldn't say that they will be killed uh, in 10 years, but at least the hosts are suitable for, for uh, oak lace bug. So the, finally, the question, this is the main question and the most important question, what can we do for the future of our oak forest? So one very important thing, very intensive, very good monitoring on international scale, and also very focused intensive research on oak has. And of course, the other important thing that forest practice, forestry practice should use the scientific results. And we have to increase resilience and diversity in our oak forest, both on intraspecific level, interspecific level, structural level. These, these are the things all increasing the resilience, the, the stability of our oak forest. We need a more holistic approach and we have to restore and strengthen health supporting ecosystem services in our forest. Finally, just an example of what I mean on their health supporting ecosystem services. So there is a pure even aged uh, homogeneous uh, cess silo stand in Hungary. This is a more diverse stand in Hungary. And it's quite evident that the regulate, regulating potential of, of uh, insectivorous birds is much better in this more diverse standards already proven by published scientific results. So this is what we can do and what we should do. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Shiroma, over to you. Thank you, George. It is a very informative presentation on all this and diseases in the region. It is very alarming to see the number of invasive species affecting our oak trees. Now, I would like you all to answer the second poll question. It is on your screen. In your opinion, what are the three major threats to oak species or oak forests in your country? We'll give a couple of uh, seconds for you to answer the question and then we'll get the um, replies. Can we have the results now, uh, please? Very interesting because 74% uh, said invasive pests and pathogens are the uh, biggest threat. And also 73% were saying um, climate change because we are three major threats. So from all this, what we can take is uh, invasive uh, pests and diseases, then climate change, 
and then uh, also native pests and pathogens. It's true with the climate change, we will have more uh, uh, outbreaks of native uh, pests as well. Now, um, I want to uh, introduce our next speaker. So we are going to uh, some other countries in the region. So our first stop is Croatia, where I am pleased to introduce the REUFIS focal point, Professor Boris Hadzove. Boris is a full professor in the Institute of Forest Protection and Wildlife Management at the University of Zagreb, Faculty of Forestry. His research areas are forest entomology, tree health decline, integrated pest management in forestry, and forest invasive aliens, uh, insect, and urban greening. He has authored many publications on forest invasive species. Boris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shiroma. Okay, and welcome to you all. So I fit, I hope you hear me all. We can hear, uh, I think we need, you need to share the screen. Now. I am sharing it. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, okay. So the presentation that I'm going to present regards one country view, one country set of serious problems and one new, new player in the ground. Just a second, I have to go back to my presentation. Okay. So that's the new player, the new invasive fitting perfectly into the Ryufi scheme. So what is the, what is the, how can I move this full screen? Okay. What are our oak forests? How do they look like? What are the, what is the function of these oak forests and how do we manage oak forests and what for do we, do we manage them for? So it's, I've seen already on the questions and answers or the questions actually that timber is quite important in countries, many countries. So, it's the same in Croatia. Uh, it's, it, it gives many, value, many values uh, and it has been under the management for uh, 150 years, roughly, since uh, during this time, uh, beginning with the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, this area of coastal, not the coastal, continental Croatia, these different colors represent just the different seed regions for just one oak species. But basically, we can consider two oak species as, as most important for creation. Forestry, biodiversity, uh, recreational uses, whatever. This is how they looked at the end of the 17th century. Uh, th those are the lost, uh, last remnants. We, don't, we only have just a couple of hectares of, of this kind of indiv individual titans. Uh, nowadays, it's as it's written here, they are, these are even aged forests. A lot of countries, I suppose, have similar way of handling these forests. They need to be harvested in a specific way or tended and then uh, getting in. So I have a set of slides, a Google Earth, so you can see this area that was harvested someplace in between 206 and 209, then how it looks in April, in two, a couple of years later, you can see these tiny lines and this greenish area, which is young oaks. Then in a, a year later or three years later, and you can see already here, there has been some cutting, but not the final cut. Here, this is an area which has been also prepared for the final cut. So in a, in a two or three steps the, during the couple of years, this forest is re rejuvenated. The old oaks are taken out and the, the 140 years is a legal period during which this, this, these oaks are being brought up to this status. This is an, a, a mature Quercus robur stand. This is how it looks when it's down. So maybe 20 hectares, five hectares, couple of hectares, up to 20 hectares you could call it a clear cut, but it's not a clear cut. And these are the surrounding checkerboard areas. 15 years old oak, then there is maybe 30, 40, 50 years old oak there. 
or another stand which is in a different period of the year, early spring, and the floodplain forests are where these forests grow along the rivers. This is what is beneath, it should be at least. This is what, when we are happy, this is one of my fellow forester colleagues looking at the beautiful uh, saplings, so dense and open to, to light, to sunshine. Now the competition starts. This is a uh, 10 to 10 years later, maybe. This is this might be the oak forest, but we have a lot of problems in due to the various uh, biotic and abio abiotic problems that we are surfacing. Uh, in 2013, a new player that was the North American invasive, the Oak Lakes Bagot Corituca Arcuata, that was already mentioned in Jury's presentation. This is the recent EPO database picture, which which shows the original uh, place of the origin. And this, this only happened since the year 2000. So imagine how many oaks worldwide are in, in threat of this insect. These are the pictures from the first publication that dates from 2013. And this is my another fellow colleague Forrester who actually brought us to the attention of the, a new player down there in, in Eastern Slavonia. Now, this is an interesting thing. Once it started, this is the, the year where the, this Google, particular Google Earth uh, shot was taken at the August of 2013. This is a normal scenery of mixed oak and ash forests in um, late summer or early, early fall. And this is how it looked three years later. So, the, okay, this is a September 29th, the end of September, but you can clearly see practically every oak tree is visible now because of the yellowing or the discoloration. Um, it was really rapidly spreading. So this is the, I have to go speedier because I have uh, some more slides, but here it started here. This is the explosion of the beginning of the story in 2013. And then it spreads along the river lines or the rivers and into the whole area of this Quercus robur, Quercus and Cecil Oak. But it's important to mention that all of these uh, roads, these are roads, highways, this, this is highway, but there are other roads and wherever there is an oak, you can now start to see in a climatically different situations and uh, in Abies alba and silver fir and, and beech and other tree species where oak is very rare, you can find them on those oaks. This is a, just a short glance to, to check, to see how the, the, those forests that are being just before final cut, this is normal color of the ash. This would be the normal color of all of these, all of these oaks would be the colored green had it not been for the oak lace buck. This is a fence against the game. So this is a standard procedure for, this only needs to be cut once and, and, and it will enter the rejuvenation phase. This is how it looks in the macro, macro scale. All of this tissue is damaged and you can, uh, you can predict and jury showed us a lot of species are competing on this food. This is just a, one image that can illustrate this is uh, the, the larval and the adult stages of the Corituca arcuata. We did work on biology, not only us, but all the countries in the, in the region. This, this is the typical cluster. This is what you, you are looking for when you see it on the underside of the le oak leaf. And then you see adults and uh, larvae and uh, clusters of adults and tarry spots, which are just an excrements. And it is when you put, when, the, when there is a shelter, natural or artificial, like in this picture, millions of them can be hiding during the winter underneath that. This picture I took yesterday from the forest nearby, my faculty forest. And this is where, this is a sticky band. Foresters know what th these are winter moths just just swarming right now. Females are inside the glue. And this is the Corituca arcuata. We have never seen them, of course, never in this, this uh, situation. Questions, because I am about the management of these forests. Does it affect the growth increment? Shortly, these are increments. These are research that we did. No, nothing detectable. Maybe the period is too short. Maybe the impact would not be even visible in the, in the tree rings. Does it affect fruiting, masting years, quality of the acorn? We did kind of a research, not a, not a published because it was not coherent enough, but we didn't see any statistically uh, reasonable differences. 
What about the premature acorn abortion? That could, we thought of that, everybody thought about that. Nothing yet, no, nothing uh, feasible because it's a difficult to, to conduct such a, such a research. So, so far, but we did have, I have to say on the positive side, we did have one masting year, uh, couple, two years ago, which means during the heavy infestation. What about the mortality of OLB? Well, seven years, nothing. Nothing consistent, nothing serious, nothing visibly growing in population like the predators that put focus on this newcomer. What about entomopathogenic fungi? Here is, you can see it later and check it out. There is a publication from Croatian researchers from the Research Institute. There is, a, there is an almost expected uh, um, situation where this fungus, Boveria pseudobasiana, defined and several others, may play some role. So Juri mentioned biological control as the only, only feasible out, uh, play out of the game. Now, there is another thing that uh, we did prove, the joint Hungarian-Croatian research, and this is, I don't have time to, to discuss it, but it, that's a confirmation that the oak forest before, that this green area, oak forest here in Hungary and in, up there in Hungary and in Croatia, were, were, were breeding in September and August and September normally, while later on where the Korituka spread into that area, it, they started and they shortened the physiology. Uh, there was a, an, uh, an initiation of the, between the international teams through the Eufresco initiative in the project we are connected in the Olbi project. If you want to have something, some information, there is this link here, our coordinator in UK and a recently published paper, Jury co-authored it. It's about the, it's a review of known and predicted impacts who is interested in possibility of checking the impacts. I will summarize now uh, and use the very, very dear concept to me. It's a phytopathologist from US, Dr. Paul Mannion, a concept of tree decline where, where there is a, we can speak about this at least 15 minutes, but just to, to give an, uh, an uh, idea how, I just, sorry, how, how, the predisposing inciting factors and the contributing factors play, play out and sometimes finish with a deadly outcome. This dead in the middle may mean a single tree, a group of trees, or even a large patches of trees. And uh, since Jury also mentioned this very important role of micro microsphera or Ericifa alphitoides, there's also a recent publication which I would I would warmly suggest for, for people who are not, or the specialists who are not familiar with this one, what is the possible outcome is uh, um, res the research was based on the analysis and the review of the ecological and evolutionary trajectory of oak powder and mildew in Europe. So we already have heard of the 120 years now it has been here. It was dramatic in the beginning. It, oaks learned to live with it with just one more important uh, uh, thing. The rejuvenation, the young saplings are very susceptible and they, if, if they are not, if they are attacked both by fungus and even with some, another player like a sub sapping insect like Korituka, then we will have big problems. And with this, I thank you for your attention and return to Shiroma. Thank you, Boris, for the excellent presentation we heard the impact of the oak lace bug on natural regeneration. Also, what the, normally what we see is powdery mildew and why we should make the special attention to it. Thank you. Now, uh, let us continue our journey across the region. We are going to the Russian Federation. I would like to invite Mrs. Uliana Chernova to deliver her presentation. Uliana is a researcher at the Laboratory for Forest Protection at the Old Russian Research Institute of Silviculture and Mechanization of Forestry. And she's graduated from Russian State Agrarian University, Moscow Timbriasev Agricultural Academy. Uliana is working on invasive insect pests, chemical and biological pesticides to protect woodlands from invasive pests. 
Uliana will tell us about the emerging pests and diseases of folks in Russia. Unfortunately, we cannot see uh, Uliana's face because of the issue with the camera. Uliana, anyway, the floor is yours. Um, uh, Harkoata was introduced to Russia in 2015 and uh, was initially. Yes. Sorry, Uliana, you can start. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and was initially found in the Krasnodar region. According to the Center of Forest Health of Krasnodar region, the total area of severe infected oak trees was about 1.2 million hectares at the end of the summer season in 2016. The pest was found due to signs of foliage damage. In the case of heavy infestation, the oak uh, trees turn yellow in the middle of the summer and lose their leaves earlier than usual. Kritu Harkwata was able to spread uh, rapidly through oak forest, so in 2018 a special survey was uh, undertaken in which we inspected of the oak trees in cities along the route from rostov on don to Mahachkala. In all major cities, the pest was found. So the map showing present of Kritu Harkwata in Russia in 2018. Based on the rate of expansion of the pest range, we assumed it possible range in uh, 2019 and 2020. Using weather maps, we have uh, compiled a possible pest range in the future. Oak forests have the greatest distribution in the European part of Russia, where the most common species is Quercus robur, and in the North Caucasus, the main species is Quercus petraea. You can see on the slide location of the oak forest in the southern part of Russia is marked red. In non-forest areas, oak trees are present in parks and street plantings. A study of our colleagues has been carried out in stands, botanical gardens, and arboretum. Symptoms of the presence of the pest are adults and nips, their excrement and eggs of Kritu-Harquata on the lower left surface, as well chloritic discoloration of infested leaves. The grading of the symptoms is as follows. 1. The symptoms very common and often abundant. 2. The symptoms common, sometimes abundant. 3. The symptoms record rare or occasional. Almost all species, uh, almost all oak species are suitable hosts. The oak lay bug was also established to develop on shrub and herbaceous species. Conducted analysis of the pest condition in wintering areas, as well as the state of egg in egg clusters on oak leaves, show that local entomophages and pathogens have no effect on the number of pests. But we observed high overwintering mortality of the bugs. One of the important factors of mortality in summer is intensive rainfall. But we could not uh, quantify the degree of death of pest uh, during heavy rains. In fact, we observed a huge number of dead adults and larvae in the sea that swam near the shore. So we tested several chemical and bacterial pesticides and obtained data showing their prospects for use in fecae of the Kretuharquata. The work was carried out in 2017 and 2018 in the Gelenjik forestry of the Krasnodar Krai on the Oak Quercus robber. The results obtained Obtained from the test showed the clonrin, lacustin, and espera provide rapid and reliable destruction of bugs. Bacterial preparation acts more slowly. Demelin and Defluzid tests had been carried out repeatedly. The results are still being analyzed. Summing up, we can say that 
The oak lays bark damage the oak forest in southern Russia, and it will spread in oak trees, European part of Russia, in the future. Pathogens and entomophages of the Kritukhar plata haven't found in Russia at the moment yet. The test made it possible to recommend several pesticides for further use in order to protect against Kritukhar plata. The pesticides can be used after completion of the registration procedure. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank, and uh, thank to the organizers for the opportunity to speak at the conference. Thank you, Liana, um, for the introducing the emerging pest and diseases fasciitis. It is all about now uh, oak leaf bug, that is the emerging one in almost all European countries. And um, we hopefully we will have more questions and answers, and we will discuss in detail a little bit later. So on our virtual tour, now we are heading to Central Asia. Our next presenter is Dr. Dani Sarsekoa. Dani is an associate professor and corresponding member of the Regional Academy of Management in Kazakhstan. Since 2012, she has been head of Department of Forest Resources and Forestry at the Seifulin Kazakh Agrotechnical University in Astana. Dani's current research includes projects on plantation forest and environmental protection. Dani, please tell us about how oaks can play a role in making cities in Central Asia healthier. The floor is yours, Dani. Большое спасибо, Шивана. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Пользуясь случаем, я бы хотела выразить свою благодарность представителям ФАО и лично профессору Ференсу Лакоташу за приглашение для участия в важном семинаре по защите дубов в регионе Европы и Центральной Азии. Тема моего, моей презентации – Называется «Здоровые дубы для здоровых городов Центральной Азии». Извините, пожалуйста, сейчас я демонстрацию экрана включу. Минутку. Один момент. Извините, видно, да? Ну, пока не видно. Не видно? Нет, пока не видно. Странно. Вроде вчера включался, но мы не было что Не могу тебя сомневать. У вас не получится там включить? Извините, не могу включить. У вас есть это... Зеленки сейчас крем. Вы можете это? Что делать? Сейчас, да. А если невозможно, мы можем показать свою э, презентацию. Все, нашла. Okay. Спасибо. Извините, пожалуйста, техническая заменка. Итак. Значение дубов, конечно, велико с точки зрения сохранения биоразнообразия лесов во всех странах Центральной Азии, которого включает вот, Казахстан, Узбекистан, Казахстан, Таджикистан и Киргизию. Киргизстан. Так как мезофильные породы дубовых лесов не характерны для наших стран. Изучение дубовых лесов интересно и с экономической точки зрения, поскольку позволяет не выяснить оптимальные микроклиматические почвенные параметры выращивания дуба, а также разработать методы ведения лесного хозяйства поймал дубовых лесов. Единственным естественным местом обитания дуба в республике Казахстан является пойма реки Урал, а также овраги и валки в пределах западно-казахстанской области Казахстана. По долине реки Урал проходит южная граница распространения дуба обыкновенно, то есть вирусы дробора. Для поймы реки Урал характерны два типа дубов. Это дубники ежевичные, которые развиты на, по центральной пойме, и дубники ландышевые, 
которые поставятся при террасном участке и центральной пойме. Городские же насаждения дуба, в основном произрастающие в Бичкеке, столице Казахстана и Чуйской области, имеют очень плохое фитопатологическое и экологическое состояние, так как на протяжении последних 20 лет здесь не проводили борьбу с вредителями зеленых насаждений. Так, с 2007 года наблюдается краткосрочные локальные скочки численности дубового минирующего кильчика профиноза Пермея в городских дубовых насаждениях города Бичкек и во всех городах Чуйской области. В городах и городских районах Казахстана и Кыргызстана много инвазивных вредителей и болезней. Я хотела бы взять пару примеров. Это вот на секунду. Так, а, потому что мы не, не можно видеть это целый экран. Вы должны нажать. Итак, возьму пару примеров. Вот на слайде вы видите насекомое вредитель, который повреждает, повреждает многие дубовые насаждения в Бичке в Киргизстане. Он называется дубовый минирующий пилильчик. Это обликатный минер, полная Личиночное развитие, которое проходит внутри листовой пластинки, поскольку личинки этого дубового минирующего пилечика не используют пищу, трудно переваривать ткани листа, то есть его эпидемиус, кутикулу и ткани сосудистых пучков. Поэтому развитие проходит значительно быстрее, чем у свободно живучих филофагов. И вот как-то показано на этом слайде, вы видите вылупленные личинки, они имеют цвет молочно-белый, Взрослые же личинки, вот как на слайде, светло-желтые, желтовато-зеленые, которые имеют коричневую голову. Длина взрослых личинок составляет 6-8 мм. Тело его состоит из 13 сегментов. Голова круглая, слегка сдавленная, имеет светло-бурый цвет. Средний и задний грудь сверху, он и не имеет пятен. На первом сегменте сверху всегда имеются продольные вот такие вот пятна, а снизу и предние на втором и третьем сегменте Имеются черные пятна и имеются три проножки. Пигментация пучных киргитов отсутствует здесь. При высокой численности минеров поврежденные листья полностью покрываются минами, вот как видно на этом слайде. И они, конечно, уничтожают все фотосинтезирующие пластинки листа. Впервые минирующий пилечек был обнаружен в 2007 году. Он был характер, для него был характерен высокий уровень повреждений. Хост дерева – это дуб, черечный или клетос робок. В 2012 году 80% дубовых деревьев в городе Бичкет было, были повреждены. И, к сожалению, до настоящего время остается высокий уровень повреждений. При высокой численности минеров поврежденные листья полностью покрываются минами и уничтожает фотосинтезирующие пластинки листа, и в конце концов листья начинают терять свой естественный цвет и форму, что можно видеть вот на данном слайде. На следующем слайде вы можете видеть места современного распространения минного пилечика, однако точное распространение этого вредоносного организма в странах Центральной Азии нужно еще определить. Мне бы хотелось теперь показать, какая же разница между поведением этого вредителя в Европе, и, который является коренным, и в Кыргызстане, где он инвазивен. В Европе это широко распространенный вид, без значительного ущерба в Европе. В то же время в Кыргызстане он вызывает серьезную опасность в городских районах. В Европе вредитель является, как я уже сказал, коренным, и он имеет хороших естественных врагов, вот, которые описаны на данном слайде. Однако в Кыргызстане естественных врагов намного меньше. Таким разным является и время вылета насекомых во вредителей в Европе и в Кыргызстане, то, то же, что вы можете видеть на данном слайде. Размножение получается в Европе половое и 
пантогенез – это в Казахстане. В Казахстане также проводились мониторинговые мероприятия. Здесь вы можете видеть и наблюдать результат, когда через день, после того, как установили ловушку. То есть их очень много. Об усыхании дуба также сообщалось в обеих странах, и это считается результатом комплексного воздействия от различных факторов, таких как глобальное потепление, падение уровня грунтовых вод, близкое залегание соленосных горизонтов, повреждение деревьев насекомыми и патогенными организмами, и также в последние десятилетия наблюдается уменьшение воды в реке Урал, в его притоках, а также другие факторы, которые влияют на такое экологическое состояние деревьев. Современное состояние дубов вызывает обоснованную тревогу, не только, обоснованную тревогу не только у лесоводов, у руководителей органов и государственной власти, но и также всего населения Республики Казахстан и Казахстан. Что же нужно важнейшей проблемой для работников лесного хозяйства в стран Центральной Азии является сохранение дубов пойменных, пойменного леса хотя бы на том уровне, ну, который имеется на нынешних, на нынешних площадях. Для того, чтобы решить эту проблему, необходимо улучшить систему мониторинга и наблюдения, использовать естественных врагов гусениц непарного шелкопряда, зеленые дубовые листовки, озимые моли, моли перечной и так далее. Затем нужно проводить лесоводственную практику, такие как посадка саженца в места, где произошло выпадение дуба, и повышать осведомленность общественности, то есть всего населения Казахстана и Казахстана и в целом Центральной Азии. Это мой, мое краткое сообщение закончилось. Большое спасибо за ваше внимание. Um, it's a really interesting presentation. It's not, we don't have many opportunities to actually um, discuss the forest health issues in Central Asia. And with the um, Rufus uh, network, we are actually talking with the Europe and Central Asia, we are linking together on common issues. It's good to see uh, this uh, collaboration and the uh, coordination work. Now, um, I want to go to the, our final stop of our virtual tour. So we are back again in Central Europe. Our next presenter is Dr. Daniel Andresi. He will tell us about an interesting project in dryland of forest. Daniel is a forest engineer as well as a nature conservation engineer graduated from Sopron University, Hungary. Currently, he works as a deputy head of research in the innovation center of the Kishkan Shark Forestry and Woodworking Company. And he's the manager of Oak Life Project. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shirona. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, I can hear, we can hear you. I will share my slide. Can you see the slide? Yes, can you put into the full mode? Because at the full moment, mode. He, he, is, it, is it in the full mode? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome everybody. I will present a practical study about the Oki Life project. Can we save the dryland oak forests? The short answer is yes, but I will take my presentation. The Oki Life uh, project is an European Union life project. The total cost of the project is about 2.7 million euro uh, and, uh, of which the EU contribution is about 1.9 million euro. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, contribution is about uh, 80,000 euro. The other part of the budget is self-sufficiency. Uh, this project started at the 1st of August of 2017, and uh, it will finish uh, in the 31st of December of 
2022. Why Oki life? Because the oak is the key of the life. Uh, Georg Choka said that uh, uh, many herbivore insects uh, live in the oak trees. Therefore, the oak is very important for us, uh, mainly in the Great Plain in Hungary. The project area located in central Hungary, uh, in uh, near Kumpaser village, uh, uh, in the northwestern part of Bakish County, uh, uh, 64 kilometers south from Buda Budapest. The forest name is Pesir Forest. This is a nature conservation area. The whole area is bigger than uh, uh, 1,600 acres. Uh, the forested area is near uh, 1,100 acres. The main of the forested area managed, managed by the CAFOG LTD. Uh, this is a Hungarian state forestry and the uh, smaller part managed by the Kiskunshag National Park Directorate. This is a Hungarian state uh, national park. Uh, managers of the project is the CAFOG LTD, and we have two uh, consortium partners. This is the Kiskunshag National Park Directorate and the BirdLife Hungary organizations. In Kumpasir, uh, there is a very rare and endangered habitat. This is the Sandstep Oak Forest. The Sandstep Oak Forest is one of the most endangered habitat in the EU and uh, in the Pannonic Biographic Region. These forests are very rich for species and the biodiversity is so big. Uh, more than uh, 1,100 flowering plants live there. There are We cannot hear you, uh, Daniel. Hello? My uh, population is the biggest in Hungary in here. Uh, the Carabus hungaricus, the Borbalasmus unicorn is also living in this habitat. Uh, therefore, we need to, to conserve this habitat. We have some objectives about the project. Firstly, we need to identify, identify quantify, and eliminate the main local factors threatening by Natura 2000 objectives. For example, we need to repel the invasive tree species. We need to enhance the nature conservation status of species and the habitat types which are community interests. We need to enlarge the area of the community interest habitat types, and we need to restore the main sustainable regulatory, conservatory, and cultural ecosystem services. We need to enhance the environment conscious behavior. And I think that the uh, most important of the objectives is to make some good practical publications uh, for the forest managers who has the similar problems. The technical actions of the project aim the survey or elimination of one individual threatening uh, factor. Major threatening factors of the project, the uh, invasive tree and herbaceous species. These invasive species present in larger numbers as we thought. We apply chemical and mechanical treatment against the invasive tree, tree species. The main enemies, Islandus saltissima, Prunus serotina, Certis occidentalis, and uh, Acer negundo. The stump depots are also threatening factors because uh, in here live many invasive tree species and invasive herbaceous species also. In the whole Great Plain, the sinking groundwater level is a great problem. In the Pesir forest, thank goodness, the groundwater level is relatively high, between 2.5 meter to 4.5 meter. 
isolated biotopes of the same habitats, forming ecological corridors and maintenance of clearings. This is very important for some in insects and some species, for example, Euphidria spatula and Borbelascus unicornis. The publicity, the professional and the office organizations are poorly informed. Therefore, we bought and renewed the forest house for a uh, forest educational or visitor center. In this center, we could educate different ages of students and people. In general, the live projects have five different action groups. The preparatory actions, the professional actions, the monitoring actions, the educational and PR actions, and the actions of the project management. In the preparatory actions, we made a full RSOR mapping. That means we all together investigate more than uh, 2,500 pieces of soil sample. We installed also three automatic groundwater monitoring well. Thanks to, thanks to these uh, things, we can plant oaks to the appropriate sites. The main of the professional actions forest structure conservation, which means uh, planting native species to replace non-native or invasive species. Uh, in the Pesier forest, uh, we planting Populus or Vercus species to replace Pinus and Robinia species. Uh, we also planting oak forest in the best sites. Uh, one of the most uh, important professional action is the control of invasive plants. Uh, all the seeds breeder trees uh, in the four forest we controlled. Uh, we will full control the invasive uh, tree species on about uh, 500 acres. Uh, the control of invasive plants has two types, the mechanic and the chemical. The mechanic types, we made a clear cut. After that, we make a stamp removal and we defluffing the area. This is the uh, best control of invasive plants, but it's very expensive. The other mechanic type is removing seedlings by hand. Uh, the chemical uh, type, herbicide injections, which means drill the trees and injects uh, herbicides. Uh, it's good for the older trees mainly. Uh, and the younger trees is good for debarking and applying herbicide. Shaping ecological corridors for some insects, for example, Euphidrias and Volbelasmus. Managing oak forest, preserve shrub patches when oak is able to propagate. In our website, we give information and news about the project. In the visitor center, we educate the students and the people. We crawl the invasive tree coverage and the habitat types of the forest in the beginning and in the end of the project. The research in the Pesier forest is also interesting and important. Uh, natural regeneration of oak is very uh, rare in the in Hungary, mainly in the Great Plain. Uh, they, with these oak trees, the Quercus rubber, uh, uh, re regenerate in various relief conditions. A high number of oak saplings survives the game grazing. Different oak species. We think, uh, yes, uh, uh, in the Side, there is a, an other oak species uh, in morphologically, the Quercus pedunculiflora, pedun, uh, pedunculate oak, the English name. Uh, it is urged the phenological method of the oaks, leaf flushing and flowering times also. We monitored and we will monitoring the insect species which are. Uh, connected to oak species such as uh, Cerambic cerdo and uh, 
Oryctus nasicornis and the and other species which has a, a endangered or community interests. Uh, the research, uh, we research the biological method of control invasive species, such as Tree of Heaven, Oilantus altissima. There are some fungi, for example, Verticillum species, which works against these three species. We research the selectivity of these fungi. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your very insightful presentation. Very good to know how we actually have the community participation on management of forest invasive species. Now, I would like to invite you to another important poll. This is the third and the last one, and a very important one. We would like to know what category do you represent? It is really good to know, um, uh, to let you know there are about more than 100 participants. It means exactly 136 participants uh, attended attending the webinar, which is a very uh, good one because it shows how important is the oak species to the region. Can we please have the results now? Yeah, as I can see, 63% um, are from the research institution. And um, uh, also from uh, regulatory, from ministries and authorities, 21%, which is very good because th this is where the, uh, the, this is, these are the policymakers and the regulators are the one who can make a difference. The researchers, we all can do the research, but it, when it comes to implementation, we really need your help. So now, um, with that, now I want to go to the next activity. It is uh, your turn. Now time to answer some of your questions. I can see now the uh, um, question and answer box. And we, it's, it's a very active, um, um, participation and also the panelists. I think you all have um, uh, the panelists have answered almost all the questions. But I really would like to uh, take uh, one or two um, uh, aspects in form. Uh, one is uh, there was the one suggestion from the uh, Iran um, because it's good to see there are some participants from Near East because Near East also has a uh, forest invasive species network and the oak um, health issues is a very big issue in the region and it's good to see the participants from there and actually the uh, the the, uh, the question was uh, not the question comment was to please mention about the oak charcoal disease um, in Iran and um, this was um, uh, actually FAO actually supported uh, this um, uh, uh, project to manage the and also improve the resilience of oak forests in Iran. And uh, it is uh, it, more than um, uh, millions of uh, oak forests has been affected by this disease. So uh, this is, uh, so it, actually it is, even though this is a regional um, uh, issue, uh, we are discussing a regional issue, it is actually a very global issue. Also, I have to mention there have been uh, many uh, uh, requests from North America for us to um, provide the recording because it's very interesting. Now, um, we'll go to uh, uh, the question. Um, there's a question from Maria uh, it's asking whether um, there's up-to-date Quakers-related research publication or programs and to share the link. So um, 
I would like actually, um, parents, would you be able to uh, answer this question because you are managing the uh, um, uh, the network? Uh, thank you, Shiroma. So, uh, unfortunately, yeah, and I can share personally as, as a person, but uh, officially we are not allowed to put any publication on the Rare Office web page. But if there are uh, usually in our uh, newsletters, in our yearly newsletters, we are uh, trying to share the most important links of the most recent publication in the field of forest invasive species, including, of course, uh, pests and pathogens on, on oaks. But they, they are not uh, restricted to, to oak species only. But of course, uh, I will try to collect as many uh, publications uh, regarding the oak leaf bug or any other invasive forest invasive species uh, linked or related to oaks uh, and to share it in our next uh, newsletter or to put at least the link for the for the publications to our web page also uh, i think it would be good if uh, all the panelists uh, um, uh, the speakers allow so maybe we can uh, send uh, um, any um, so, the they are uh, uh, through the newsletter we can send their contact details because i understand because of the privacy law in eu we cannot share the contact details on the websites but uh, uh, through the network or newsletter maybe we will find a way to share the uh, contact details all these experts and, and further, if the uh, panelists do agree then we would be more than happy to put their presentations uh on on the rare office website as well so just to have it uh, available for for the participants and for for other people if they do agree of course i will definitely need an agreement from our panelists or from our presenters there's another question i think this one um, um to um yuri choka so here uh, asking are there any possible chemical ways to get rid of of the koritu char kata is it too expensive or there are any problems with that and expect its environment to have that and boris you also can add anything over to you Gyori. thank you shirma yeah it's it's possible in theory there are chemicals which can be very very effective against oakley spark it's I think it's possible to use in parks or in private gardens, but I would I would very very strongly avoid it in forests. So the uh, first of all, it's it's very expensive, but even more importantly, the undesired side effects are very very strong. So when you let's say kill kill oak lace bug, what you want to kill, you would kill probably. Uh, dozens and dozens and other species you want you you wouldn't want to kill so the side effects are very very uh, serious i wouldn't use any chemicals against uh, oakley's bug in in real forests the the parks and and tree nurseries and and uh, maybe roadside trees are different but in forest i i would avoid it as much as possible If she, Boris, she, do you want to add anything? Uh, I, I, I totally agree. And even even another question on the, if, if that's the question that you read, absolutely no question about this. I, I don't suppose that ever it will be possible, not even think about the, the open space and the even the landscape uh, situations in the cities and urban uh, situations. It's a, until we have some kind of a biological control, which I'm not sure we will ever have, the Boveria is also problematic. So it's really, to my opinion, it's going into the, like Corituca ciliata on platanus trees. It's much the same situation, except for the, for the tree species. This, this one is going to be conquering the Europe. And I don't think chemi chemistry is not the solution. Even in the European Union, I mean, our hands are tightly, tightly, uh, even legally looking. We are, we are not have no possibilities for that and one one entomological experience it's hard to keep this insect alive in the lab it's amazing how it's it's touchy and and prone to 
I don't know what kind of mortality. Of course, you can do it. You can test various chemicals. We did it too. And, but in the field, it's not so easy. So no would be my answer. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, um, also, I go to a very uh, um, a general question from Pakistan, uh, from Amjad Sultan. It's asking, how can FAO can help research institute for universities in Pakistan? This is something um, I think uh, what we can do is, in Pakistan, there's the FAO office. Um, and also, if you can contact the FAO office with the research, because we are we are not an organization is working on research, so um, if there are a particular thing, it would be very good if you go to the Pakistan um, the FAO office and discuss with the whatever the um, uh, requirements you have. In some cases, we we uh, provide the uh, in the improvement of institutional capacities, but so therefore you need to go and discuss that one. Um, then. Um, there's a, another question. Um, uh, it says it's on the chart. Um, this is for um, Yuri. Um, it says, um, how do you see the future of uh, the um, oak species because the climate change is happening? Um, so, because uh, it's not clear whether it's asking about the oak species or whether it's asking about the invasive species. So how about we, because we have some time, um, uh, I would like Alexis to answer about the climate change and oak species, what is happening. And Yuri, maybe you can answer climate change and invasive species. First, over to you, Alexis. Okay, do you hear me? Okay. The question is asking, the, because the, the climate change impact on oak species. Okay, uh, for uh, common species uh, and widespread species like uh, Cecil oak or uh, pedunculate oak, uh, the species can uh, survive without any problem and they can evolve easily. Even if we have huge decay with the species, that means we have to work with the species. For minor species, minor species, there is a high risk that the species disappear within a few uh, decades. And in this case, we must uh, have a program uh, to uh, preserve the species with uh, assisted migration. And for common and the rare species, we have to boost uh, all the um, uh, evolutionary process to protect uh, and restore the population of seed disperser, of pollen disperser, not the pollen disperser because it is wind disperser, sorry. Uh, uh, we have to increase uh, the um, uh, natural selection uh, process. And in this case, we have to uh, fight against uh, deer and so on. And uh, in this case, I am quite optimistic that uh, the hawk uh, could survive because the species has a very high genetic diversity. They have a very high speed for evolution. And uh, with this uh, tool, the species can uh, evolve and uh, resist to the species. The problem is to maintain uh, different function of oak forest like uh, production of wood, uh, all the ecological services of this uh, species. Is Over okay? to you, Yuri, now about the climate change and invasive species affecting the oak uh, trees. Would you be able to make a comment on it? Yeah, I, I thank you. I can make a comment. So Alexis answered the question on, on species level. So how to save, how to protect species. My approach is a bit, bit let's say, lower level. I, I would like to answer the question, how can we save, how can we protect oak forest in a given region or even a, even a single oak forest? I, I think the Sylvie culture has a serious potential in increasing, increasing the tolerance, uh, resistance and, and resilience of forests. So they, if, they, if we increase the 
the diversity and resilience of our oak forest with with more more heterogeneous uh, strength stand structure uh, mixing species and so on and so on so we can we can uh, decrease the risk coming from uh, either from from uh, climate change or invasive species there are very fine publications how and why mixed forest and and uh, more forest with more diverse structure how can they they survive how can they tolerate the climate change and, and also how can they they uh, slow down the spread of of invasive species so i think the silviculture the way way how how we manage our forest is very important and what we have to admit that the the climate change and invasive species just somehow uh, make the uh, make the uh, management uh, mistakes stronger so they just point that you, you you shouldn't do that in the future because climate change will have a very strong effect on that forest if you if you use clear cuts or or if you if you don't take care of uh, diversity of forests so the the management and the silviculture has a great potential, in my opinion, to, to mitigate the, the negative impacts of, of climate change and, and invasive species. Thank you very may, much. May, yes. may I add some comment, please? Yes, yes, please. Uh, okay, for the uh, forester, uh, um, if we want to boost uh, the genetic process of evolution, we must restore connection between the forest to plant uh, edge or uh, forest between uh, corridor. But we have to restore corridor between the forest. We have to protect the, all the seed dispersers like jay, uh, crow, and so on. We have to protect uh, large carnivores like uh, bear, wolf, lynx, and so on, and restore the population. We have to protect also uh, small carnivores, which reduce uh, the population of all like uh, uh, fox, badger, and so on. And all uh, uh, this work probably we help hope to survive. Thank you very much, Alexis. Uh, may I have just a may yeah. I have just a very short comment? This is what Alexis said: a more holistic approach to forest management. That's that's all. I totally agree. That is indeed because I think when we talk Can about I say the a few in, more inter... words about Kritukharkuata. Yeah. I agree uh, just, uh, with uh, Choka and uh, Hrasavets, uh, and uh, we will continue on working in this problem. And uh, we want to try uh, to rear Erasmus Klopamor. Thank you very much, Liana. I was about to ask you about what chemical, uh, whether are you using any chemical or biological uh, control uh, method? Because there is a question in Russian from uh, Ukraine, Vitaly uh, Stegna. Uh, it's about the chemical uh, availability of chemical um, methods for insect pests in forest. But uh, what we have to say is we are actually discouraging the use of uh, uh, chemical uh, methods. The uh, reason is the forest is full of biodiversity and we need to make sure there are a lot of uh, um, and species uh, uh, there and then we need to uh, make sure we are using less and less chemicals. So we are uh, trying to uh, uh, encourage people to use more um, the biological control and other IPM methods. So now I have a very interesting question. Uh, it's from, uh, uh, okay, now um, uh, I would like, actually there has been a small uh, uh, problem with the interpretation. So there's a request, uh, Uliana, would you be able to a little bit explain about your uh, chemical, the research in, the, uh, in Russia? Over to you, Uliana. Uliana, are you there? Seems to be we lost her. Okay. 
we'll come back to that one again. And um, now there's a question on um, acute of decline. And this is a very big issue in uh, um, UK. And uh, I, we did not see uh, saying there was no mention about in uh, in this webinar because we had only one one or two mentions about oak dieback and also decline, but it's not very um, not with a specific uh, uh, focus. So uh, Yuri and Boris, uh, would you be able to uh, comment on that uh, acute oak decline uh, in Europe in other countries? If I, yes, I may just, it's over to you. Thank you, Shiroma. I just uh, written. I did a written reply to that one. So considering Croatia, no, nothing, nothing like like in the picture that uh, we've seen from France. But I don't know what that was. The, the a bunch of dead oak trees, but nothing like anything dramatic uh, that uh, that would consider or suggest a decline sudden of that kind of thing not not here thank you and there's a very interesting question from Tibor Takasi and he was asking how can the wider population be involved in this fight being underfunded and un understaffed is a serious problem apart from awareness raising what can we do to get people on our side so I will also like to uh, make a comment on that. But before that, um, uh, very quickly, I want every panelist to tell one uh, statement. Over to you. Uh, we can start from parents. Thank you, Shiroma. So I think uh, the, the best way to rise awareness is to include the broader public as far as possible. So to, to try to, to involve the people who are partly interested or just just uh, interested in any kind of, of, of nature and they are just uh, they just like they love to to walk or to run in, in in the forest and if you can make them interested in to look for for invasive species or in general uh, to look for the health condition of the forest they will definitely provide you very valuable information information. Boris had already uh, showed an initiative in this sense on the Oak Lace Bark, but there are definitely several other ones as well. Thank you, Shiroma. Thank you. Um, you uh, Yuri, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just, I just agree with Ferry. And so th there are many ways to, to reach the, the wider audience. I mean, the, the, the wider population uh, of the people. So, so of course, internet, uh, based citizen science programs can help and and everything else but it's it's, it's a very hard hard work and and needs a lot of energy and time to to widen the scope and to show show results and show consequences of uh, for for uh, citizens and involve them but if, if there is a fine let's say a fine web page where you can make make them interested in in let's say what happens in our forest, and they will visit that that web web page uh, frequently. That that probably can help. We we are also working on on web pages like this. Uh, hopefully, will help to to involve as many people as possible. That's all I wanted to comment on it. Thanks. Can I join? Sorry, Daniel, uh, do you have a very quick uh, answer for that in improving the public awareness? Sorry, Beach. Um, do you know, uh, do you have any comment on uh, improving the public awareness? Public art, uh, maybe, <laughs> no, not yet. Okay, yeah, thank you. Now, uh, I think we have only another four minutes. So uh, we, we, we have, if we, are, if we miss any questions, but we are going to do, we'll answer all the questions and we'll Can put I say? on the website. Ah, yes, uh, it's good to hear, Liana. You, over to you. Uh, when Tristan uh, 
pesticides, several concentration of working fluid with uh, free uh, replicates were used. Uh, spraying was uh, carried out using a manual sprayer. In uh, this case, uh, the spraying was uh, carried out uh, into the first drop, a spraying of the foliage. Then we waited for the foliage to dry uh, to put bugs. Uh, mortality rate of bugs was carried out every day after two months, uh, uh, some pesticides uh, acted slowly because of uh, which the broken uh, branches uh, in cages uh, uh, during up. Uh, so we were looking for clean uh, branches on oak trees uh, without bugs. And after uh, that, bags of meal uh, uh, gas were placed on them, and uh, uh, bugs uh, were planted inside. I can um, uh, second, please uh, slide the старой презентации. Секундочку. You can see uh, the foliage preceded by uh, pesticides, uh, uh, bouquet with bugs in cages, and uh, cages for uh, bugs on oak trees. Thank you very much, Juliana. Very, uh, very good answer to uh, Vitali's questions uh, from Ukraine. And uh, now um, I think it is uh, time uh, for us to. Um, there are there's uh, one question um, from. I will go to the last question. This is uh, Simon Lawson, I think, believe. Um, this question to Alexis uh, is asking naturalist and similar existing citizen science websites are potentially great resources for increasing public awareness and. Uh, surveillance of uh, invasive pests. Um, so Alexis, uh, would you like to answer that one? Yes, uh, in France, we have a lot of um, initiative uh, with uh, citizen uh, science and uh, the, we can have uh, um, uh, experience with bird watching, botany, is there, we, we have uh, apps uh, which uh, allow to determine uh, plants uh, and so on. And uh, in my forest, I, we have started uh, um, very interesting uh, work with the local population. We have um, a workshop on ecological restoration with local population and it is organized by the mayor of, my, of the city uh, close to, to, to my forest. And now this experience is spread in uh, uh, several large forests and uh, it is very interesting because people are very interested by this uh, workshop where they are learning how to, to, to determine and mark uh, uh, trees with microhabitat to restore uh, 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 population or rare plants and so on. And uh, it is one way to to initiate the population to uh, uh, to the nature and to the ecological restoration and the management of the forest also. And we have uh, uh, now a nature uh, uh, trip each year with the local population and with um, uh, naturalists. Thank you very much, Alexis. I think we will, we have more questions. But um, um, so the la may, this is the last question because we can be late maybe about five ten minutes. So uh, if you can stay. Um, so the last question is um, from Bjorn uh, Auckland and and he's asking uh, it's a long question uh, with explanation. I will read it for um, translation. Northern borders of uh, Numeral and uh, border numeral vegetation zones are putting northward with climate change and with that also where our quakers can grow in northern Europe. There is less problem with drought and mentioned pest on oak in northwest of Europe, Scandinavia, where our quakers rubber and quakers petria are main species. Could future management of expanding the range of quakers be advised? The question is to Alexis. You are very popular today. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I think uh, all the European country and all the countries in the world must develop a, a program of um, uh, assisted migration, and we don't. don't uh, we must uh, sing to this migrated, uh, assisted uh, migration at ecosystem level. And we have uh, a program in France where we are trying to create a small patch of um, uh, future uh, ecosystem where we mix different species from warmer region or uh, genetic resources from warmer uh, region. And the small island uh, will spray all the seed in the new in the in the forest, and we will we hope to create new forests. But in this case, you must also restore the population of seed disperser, pollen disperser, the connection between the, the forest, and so on. And uh, it is a huge uh, work, and we are starting this work in, in France. Thank you very much, Alexis. I think we can stay longer and longer if the Zoom allows us, but I think it's time for us to conclude now. So um, and now um, I would like to um, invite our regional forestry officer, Dr. Norbert Winkler Ratoni, forestry officer in the FAO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia, to give his concluding remarks. Um, Norbert studied forestry at the University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Science in Vienna, Austria, and he completed his PhD on forest harvesting, watershed management, and erosion control. Before joining the FAO Regional Office, he worked in various positions in functions on forestry and forestry-related issues in Austria for the European Commission in Brussels, also as a consultant for FAO, in the field for in several countries around the globe. Norbert, the screen is yours. Thank you, Jerome, and good afternoon to all participants of today's FAO and RFIS webinar. Uh, first, uh, let me start by thanking you all, to all the speakers for the inspiring uh, presentations, which provided insight into the current status of oak species and forests in our region, as well as, as well as related challenges for protecting them for future generations. Uh, the great interest we had, um, and uh, Jerome already mentioned it, we had more than 130 participants from Reufis countries and beyond joining the webinar and several requests by colleagues from North America to produce a video record of today's event for those who couldn't join because of the time difference. This interest shows that the Reufis network team together with FAO have selected a very relevant uh, topic uh, for forestry in Europe and Central Asia. As mentioned by Jerome, I'm with the Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia, actually since 2010. And uh, what I can observe in recent years is an increasing number of requests from countries seeking support from FAO to tackle forest health problems, but also to address forest and landscape restoration issues. The region has, a hu has huge areas of degraded broadleaf forests, particularly in Southern Europe and Central Asia. It is very positive to see that there are national and international commitments of various countries in the region to increase the forest cover, as well as large scale restorations uh, projects, uh, which are under preparation. We also have to ensure that our forests and forest ecosystems are resilient to threats, including invasive species. Uh, today's webinar highlighted the importance of research on emerging pests and diseases, but also showed the necessity for more collaboration on cross-border efforts in prevention and management of forest invasive species. Uh, traditionally, oaks are very important species uh, to our region. As we saw from today's presentations, there's a number of challenges for oak species, 
but also for us, the way we manage uh, oak forests in the region. Let us work together, researchers, forest managers, forest owners, and conservationists to protect the future of oaks. Thank you once again for your participation and over to you, Shiroma. Thank you, Norbert. It's a great way to conclude the webinar. As time is coming to an end, I want to thank our all the speakers for the excellent presentation and all the supporting hands behind the scenes, the interpreters for their excellent interpretation, and also very special thank to Iliko Buglio, Katharina Kulik, and also Elizabeth Yele for their fantastic support in preparing this event. And of course, big thank you to all the participants, one of the best active participation we have had recently. So thank you very much for joining us today. Have a nice rest of the day or evening. Goodbye and Dasidania.